talk about it too much, but have you ever had like an absolute fail? Like somebody wasn't happy with their costume or something like didn't hold together right? <laughs> yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> I'll tell you one, one thing, just because we were just talking about Mad Apple, so that's what's on my mind. But we had this girl who, she does aerial pole. So that means she's on a pole and she, you know, flips and does different things you know, handstands and things on this flying pole and flies around. And so she was part of the opening number and they wanted her to be, uh, the theme of Mad Apple is New York, obviously. So they wanted her to be um, the Statue of Liberty to open the show. And then you see her flying around while everyone's dancing. And then at the very end, she did this thing where she starts at the top of the pole and then she drops and stops, you know, before she obviously falls off the pole. It's very dramatic. It's a rubber pole, black. And Statue of Liberty was actually not meant to be worn by her but they decided in the middle of like hey wouldn't it be cool if she could wear it so she could wear it but it was like a leotard and had nude legs well every time she would slide on that pole it would rip holes <gasps> into no. her right in between her legs and then be black so it was like black ripped holes like on her legs and then it would have to be ready for the next oh. show if we were in a oh, show Welcome to the So Inspired Podcast, where we unravel the stories behind the stitches. My name is Trisha. And my name is Alex. Each week, we'll be sharing our own sewing tales and inviting special guests to join us on the show. From favorite sewing techniques to must-have products and even some hilarious sewing mishaps. We'll be covering it all. Whether you're a seasoned sewing pro, a beginner, or just curious about the world of sewing, this podcast is for you. So grab your needles, your thread, and maybe a glass of wine and plan on leaving here So, so Inspired. inspired. Trisha Camacho has an extensive resume as a professional pattern maker for the live entertainment costume industry. Her ease of teaching and clear instruction have allowed her to teach thousands of students how to bring their fashion dreams and ideas to life. Pattern making is her gift, and now she's sharing it with the world. You can find out more about how to learn from her and all she has to offer by visiting creativecostumeacademy.com. Well, let's welcome Trisha Camacho with Creative Costume Academy. Hello, Trisha. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing good. How are you, ladies? We are doing awesome. I we are so so happy to have you here. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited. So we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So we're going to get right to it. Uh, do you want to go ahead and tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Trisha Camacho. I'm the owner of Creative Costume Academy. I have um, 20 plus years experience making costumes for um, the entertainment business, like with clients ranging from Cirque du Soleil, Blue Man Group, um, Jersey Boys, Broadway shows, operas, and everything in between. Um, so that's where my knowledge base comes from. Um, since 2013, I've been teaching others how to make patterns, so pattern making. And um, and I think it was 2018 or 2019, I moved my classes online. So I have um, a couple of online pattern making schools. I call myself your pattern nerd friend because <laughs> I'm kind of a about it, a nerd about it proudly. Um, and I kind of teach it in a different way. Um, and I like to have fun and encourage others that they can learn it too. Cause I feel like pattern making has this stigma that people are afraid to learn it, or they feel like it's going to be too hard that they can't do it. And I'm here to tell you that maybe you can, <laughs> and maybe you should try a different way. Um, so that's kind of my mission is to, um, change, change people's opinion about pattern making and help them help everyone who wants to learn, learn it. That's awesome. I, I have to like reel back just a little bit to like the blue man group and Cirque du Soleil. How yeah. on earth did you get into that? Um, that is honestly what I've done for work. That's the only thing I've done for work other than now I teach pattern making mostly. Um, but besides when I was in high school, I was a coffee barista. So I just always loved theater and sewing. I've been sewing since I was probably seven years old. Um, and, and making patterns before I even knew what patterns really were. I just kind of had an idea and I'm like, I could figure this out. Um, <laughs> and then in high school, I kind of fell in love with theater and drama and live entertainment and but realized that you know when I was in graduating high school I was like I'm not good enough or competitive enough to be like on stage I thought it wasn't really the path I wanted to go down um and I really didn't 
feel drawn to the fashion industry either. Um, I felt like it was competitive and, and I'm just not a competitive person. (laughs) So I was like, what do I do? You know, if I, if those are my interests, but I don't like either of those fields. And I took off and went traveling after high school actually, which is pretty up there with pattern making too. Um, and kind of on that time when I was traveling around, I was talking about what I was going to do and somebody mentioned costume design and that way I could be sewing and making things and still involved with the theater, but not on stage. And I was like, Oh my God, that's genius. That's the perfect thing. So I just started, um, you know, volunteering for different local theaters, um, Mm. when I got back to California and, figured out what I needed to learn. I did go to um, school and took a costume certificate, costume design certificate. And that's where I learned pattern making because it was a mix of like theater classes and fashion classes. And yeah, and that school kind of got me connected and started working Knott's Berry Farm, Snoopy Rocks on Ice, I think was my first show. (laughs) Um, (laughs) <laughs> the way that it works in that world, in that industry is, is networking and reputation. So just from being involved and, and working hard and, and kind of making connections and led to more and more things. And we actually, we still, we still make costumes. That's still my business. So I've had that business. I've had my own business for 13 years now. And we also, Disney is another one of our big clients. So yeah, we still, I don't do as much of the sewing anymore because <laughs> I'm doing more teaching these days, but I do have a crew, a small crew that we call on when we get really busy. So Nice. So how many people are in your crew? Um, I have one full-time employee that I just hired in January, my first full-time employee. Um, so she's kind of my project manager, Crystal, and she keeps track of everything. And then we have another lady, Yvonne, who's actually sewing right now. If you're hearing <laughs> the machine in the background, um, that's what we're working on. Lovely sound. <laughs> and then we have, um, we have just a couple people that we'll call on. So when we did our first big Disney project, we had 13 people working on that project. So it really just depends on in that industry. It kind of, everything happens at the same time. You'll be like, Hmm, we don't really have any projects. And then you start putting feelers out and then all of a sudden you have like six projects and you don't want to turn them down because you know, you don't know when you'll get it. We have three people working on this project that we're working on right now. That's awesome. So I do have a question. Are there any costumes out there that we could go, hey, Trisha worked on that when we're at Disney? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Disney is, you know, I have to, they are pretty hardcore with their NDA, uh, non-disclosure. Oh, I'm not allowed to say. (laughs) Okay, we won't dig too much. I can say that that we've worked on them, but as far as costumes that I've made, um, we opened, well, I helped open a show for um, Cirque du Soleil on the Las Vegas Strip last year at this time. We're actually about to celebrate our one year anniversary. So that show is called Mad Apple. It's at New York, New York and Las Vegas. And I would say I at least, if I didn't pattern, I probably made the pattern for about 90% of those costumes <laughs> in that wow. show. Wow. So That's I was amazing. Gonna, <laughs> at this point, when I get hired to do stuff like that, I'm, I'm kind of hired on as, um, and that's what I used to do was like go and install shows. And sometimes, you know, I'll still do it, obviously, but I'll go and, and be kind of the liaison between the designer and the stitchers, figuring out what she wants, um, drafting the pattern, relaying that to the stitchers, and then kind of overseeing our stitchers. I think we had, gosh, probably around 15 stitchers for that show. Is it utter chaos? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of a long hours and when you're doing something like that and that's where I've kind of developed my patterning skills that I do is because things change constantly you know um it needs to work it needs to fit it needs to look exactly the way it needs to look and then when you're dealing with circus performers um or any performers but it has to be comfortable for them to be able to do what they need to do on stage. So it's Mm -hmm. it's a lot of elements. Um, And then for something like Mad Apple, when we got into running dress rehearsals, (laughs) we didn't really ever have a full dress rehearsal without like executives and an audience. Um, Mm -hmm. So every rehearsal was kind of like a show. So obviously 
you know, things change when you're in that stage. So at the end of the night, at like midnight, we're like, so what did you think? And they're like, mm, I kind of, you know, can we see this by tomorrow's show? And then it's a mad dash in the morning to get it, change it. And then when you have something like that, they have to get approved on stage for safety and, and all of that. And then you have to fit and alter and all those things. So <laughs> it's a very wow. fast paced environment. Um, to the point where that's kind of why I wanted to move into teaching because I knew that I wasn't going to be able to sustain that for a long time. And I found other rewards, you know, in teaching. It's great to see your work on stage um, and have the performer love it and feel comfortable and, and realize that designer's dream. But um, with the teaching, I feel like, I mean, I get messages all the time of people saying, oh my God, you've changed my life. I can now make things that fit me. I helped a woman make her wedding dress um, virtually, you know, in three weeks. And so the reward is, is a little different. And I love, the thing I love about the costumes is it's not normal stuff. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm often asked to make really out there things. So as a pattern maker, I find that fun. Like I like the challenge. I'm like, Ooh, okay. Let's see how we're going to figure this out. That's incredible. You probably don't want to talk about it too much, but have you ever had like an absolute fail? Like somebody wasn't happy with their costume or something like didn't hold together. Right. <laughs> yeah. It happens all the time. <laughs> Which is why I think it's, in, I, I like to encourage my students, it's okay to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to, you're going to have fails. It's part of sewing. It's part of like putting things together and learning things. You know, working in that environment was really hard. I mean, there were things that were made by other people that failed, but that wasn't really my thing. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you one, one thing, just because we were just talking about Matt Apple, so that's what's on my mind, but we had this girl who she's a she does aerial pole so that means she's on a pole and she you know flips and does different you know handstands and things on this flying pole and flies around and so she was part of the opening number and they wanted her to be uh, the theme of mad apple is new york obviously so they wanted her to be um the statue of liberty to open the show and then you see her flying around while everyone's dancing and then at the very end she did this thing where she starts at the top of the pole and then she drops and stops, you know, before she obviously falls off the pole. It's very dramatic. It's a rubber pole, black, and the um, Statue of Liberty was actually not meant to be worn by her, but they decided in the middle of like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if she could wear it? So she could wear it, but it was like a leotard and had nude legs. Well, every time she would slide on that pole, um, it would rip holes. <gasps> into no. her right in between her legs and then be black so it was like black ripped holes like on her legs and then it would have to be ready for the next oh. show if we were in a oh, show no. so there were about three or four there were about three days i would say where they were like so we tried it uh, with the one fabric she did it in rehearsal it worked we did it in the show that night and at the end, you had these big holes, and so we had to replace the legs. But we're like, you guys can't do this as a show maintenance. <laughs> replace these every show. Um, mm -hmm. So we tried different materials, like denim would hold up better. It would turn black, but it wouldn't rip the hole. So we were like, we're getting closer. But then it didn't look as nice because, you, you know, denim doesn't act as the same as Lycra does. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah, every – that was kind of – <laughs> <laughs> not a part of that show every day we were like reinventing and then and then the director said well maybe the statue of liberty needs to wear jeans like like you know she's a hipper more modern statue of liberty instead of this pretty kind of ethereal one that we were working with so we went with that but then the jeans were very boring and then aesthetically you know they're like eh, it's not really nice well we're like we did it i drafted <laughs> those jeans the stitchers put them together. We held a fitting like two hours later. We made alterations. Then we had to test it on stage. And then it went in that night. Like every day was like that. And and I had patterned and made a whole other costume that had to go in that night. Oh, wow. So, um, and then after I left, I had to actually leave right before they had opened. So after I left, they had hired a different, like an aerial pair um, that did something else. And they're like, you know, instead of having this girl slide on the pole and destroy, let's put the aerial girl who's not sliding on a pole um, in friction. Because I was like, does she have to do that at the end? I mean, I know it's impressive, but it just, do you want this costume or do you want her to do that? Because there's only um, so many 
Thank you. So yeah, it's all about problem solving, especially um, with costumes. And you just have to keep trying things to see whether it's going to work or not. And, and hopefully you work that out in rehearsals where you're not doing in front of an audience, but sometimes, um, you know, we all have to kind of do the best that we can and, and make it work. And if it's not perfect, then you have, you know, the next show to try and get it to be better. So yeah, yeah. it does happen. <laughs> I can see why you have started to switch to teaching. Yep. <laughs> so impressive. Yeah, yeah. Little less like, whew, stressing out. Yeah. Just hearing about less. it. But like the adrenaline rush. Goodness. Yes. It is. And it's, and it's, it's, it's funny because when we're in it, you know, it's hard not to get sucked into it and, and, and be just like, I need to live here and do nothing else but figure this out. But at the same time, you know, you need to take care of yourself too. So that, that's mm -hmm. always the hard part about that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that's what I love now about <laughs> getting to step away from that a little bit, but you do miss that rush. And then, you know, we work with the same crew of people. So you kind of become a family because you can't go through mm -hmm. something like that and not kind of bond with people. You know, it's like going through war or birthing a baby. <laughs> and you're like, Whoa, we did that, you know? Um, and everyone's working together as a team and we're all, you know, going for the same goal. And I love it. I do love the adrenaline rush and I do, I do miss that, but um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm okay to, been, I've been there. I've done it enough. Um, I enjoy it, but I don't push that hard anymore. I did have the opportunity to take one of your classes. So switching gears back to your teaching, you are an amazing teacher. Oh. Your energy is awesome. Unfortunately, we were, um, well, unfortunately or fortunately, we were preparing for So Creative Live. So I didn't get to complete the whole thing. However, I did get the first class and I was just like, oh my gosh, I need to learn this. This is so cool. <laughs> oh, so. awesome. Thank you so much. I just... I really, the thing, I mean, like I said, there's a stigma that I have seen or heard around the subject of pattern making. And I focus on pattern making because it's something that I love truly. And I feel like, you know, I love sewing too, obviously, but I feel like when you understand pattern making, you understand fitting, you can make adjustments, you just have more power. And I think that my knowledge of pattern making has allowed me to have this career because I kind of became known. I lived for 11 years in, in Las Vegas, which is how I have a lot of those connections. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's allowed me, I became, that's what I was going to say. I became like the figure it out girl, you know, they would come to me with the most crazy, the craziest things. And I'm like, I get, a, I get a kick out of it. You know, I'm like, Ooh, let's figure that out. Like upside down mm -hmm. monkey statues wearing um, 18th century jackets that um, <laughs> look like they're blowing in the wind and have to be removable, you know, things like that. I'm like, all right, let's dig into it. I just, and it's because of my knowledge of pattern making that I'm not afraid to take things like that on because I know with what I know, I can figure it out. And I, I, I see what happens with my students when they start to figure it out and they're like, Oh my God, like it's, it's a light bulb that goes off and it just, that's the biggest kick for me. So when I'm sharing about it and when people are starting to have that realization, that gets me even more excited. And I just, I have fun with it and I want people to see that side of it. I feel like when it's when pattern making has been taught, you know, in, in the past or by other people, they don't get to that part. Like they, they start with drafting a, a, a bodice or a sloper, like, and that is an important skill, but it, it uses a lot of math and it's a lot of, if it's new to you, if it's a whole new world to you, that could be hard to visualize what you're trying to do. And then you don't get to come to the fun part. You don't, you give up. You're like, this is too hard. You know, yeah. like, I don't get it. It's not for me. And you give up before you see how really cool and powerful it can be. So that's kind of why I, I get excited and, and, and I want, I am truly like excited and passionate about it. Um, and I try to share that with others and, and then we jump into like, let's just have fun and then you can see how cool it is. And then if you want to go back and learn, you know, the more difficult stuff or if you kind of, some people like math, um, some of those strange people out there like, <laughs> you know, and that, and I really love drafting and I, and I do use it, but I don't use it as much as I use all the other, 
you know, things that I teach and it's not the only way. So I'd rather people start realizing how fun it can be, how, how simple it really can be once you do understand these things so that it, it helps motivate you to keep, to keep going, you know, cause I feel like if you don't have that initial confidence or that initial, like, Oh, you know, or realization of what's possible, then you're going to give up before you even learn mm -hmm. all the stuff. So that's, that's, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Cause I, I just, I do, I get a kick out of people when they're like, Oh, you know, like you can see that light bulb and then, and then other people can get excited about it too. Well, I love your excitement about the dart. So I know you have a motto. <laughs> It's all, it's all about the dart. It's all about the dart. So when taking that class, I was like, I was hearing you all the time. It's all about that dart. It's all about the dart. <laughs> I'm like, it really is. I wish make t-shirts. <laughs> and I've actually That's had her go idea. and design t-shirts, and, and um, which I think is really cool. But yeah, I have a couple things <laughs> that have become kind of my my mottos, I guess. I think I should do like a Trisha's sayings or something. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I love I just I love everything that you said because we say in here all the time, we say everything is figure outable. And it's like when you when you take the pressure off of something being perfect or you having to know exactly how to do it and just realize that you can just enjoy figuring it out and realizing that even if you mess up, you can figure out a new way. You can figure out a new way. And that makes it so much more fun mm -hmm. and enjoyable. And then once you get to the very end and you have something actually actually completed because a lot of the times we don't complete something because we feel like we don't know how we're going to get there. And it's like, that part doesn't matter. And then once you do finally complete it, it feels, you know, it feels so rewarding because you're like, I took nothing and made this out of, you <laughs> yeah. know, just imagination. And it just makes it so much more enjoyable. And I love seeing your enthusiasm. You're very inspiring. And I'm, I'm just glad that you're teaching other people to do what you're so passionate about. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. And I have another um, favorite saying. I didn't make it up. I heard it somewhere. But um, perfectionism is just procrastination in fancy shoes. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at, over at Brian. We're both like, oh. <gasps> <laughs> because, I mean, nothing is ever going to be perfect. And I tell my students all the time. Even though I've been doing this forever, um, I've been sewing for most of my life and I've, you know, been doing it and teaching it. I, I still, every time I make something, I think, oh, you know, next time I do that, I'll do this differently. Or, you know, maybe I should have used this instead of that. Like, it's okay to it for it not to be perfect, to like learn something and be done with it and be like, and I also love, I kind of love my flaws. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I was learning, I, my grandfather was an artist. So I've always kind of dabbled in, in making things and creating things in art. And I was learning how to draw or like scale up a cartoon or something like that. And it worked really well. It was a, just like a, a copying or a scaling up of something. And I showed it to my, I remember like in, I was grade school or something and I showed it to my friends I was like look at what I drew you know I was so excited I drew this they're like you didn't draw that and I said yeah I did I was like I was like look at this little difference here I kind of messed up there like I would point out where I had messed up to prove that I had drawn it and I feel that way about little mistakes like if you know the little flaws that are yours then then it, it kind of makes it special it's handmade like anything that's handmade is not going to be perfect and cookie cutter. And that's kind of like, if you can learn to love that part of it, then I think like what you were saying, Alex, about enjoying the journey and figuring it out is part of the process. It's not about getting to the end and having this perfect thing because perfect sometimes isn't even attainable or even what you want. You know? Yeah. Well, I know personally, I had to tell myself like, I have to slow down and enjoy the process because I would try to rush and be mm -hmm. like, okay, I have to get this done and it has to be perfect. And so I slowed it down and I have people like Alex now that's mm -hmm. everything is figure outable. I'm like, Hey, this is great. You know, we're learning from each other and just enjoying the process. I love it. Love it so much. Yeah. Can I say something? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Come on in. Trisha, I want to let you know that uh, my oh. shorts ripped and I just hand sewed them because I have never hand sewn before. <laughs> and I was inspired by you. I was like, I'm going to do this for Trisha Camacho today. I'm going to hand sew my pants. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> 
he will have the power to fix that. <laughs> not, it, is, it is not a perfect scene. They look funky doodle, but I <laughs> funky they doodle, still work, right? And you did that with your hand. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> we just need to like get shirts embroidered with all these yeah. things. Funky doodle. The one that you said, Trisha, that's amazing. I'm gonna keep I I like the fancy shoes part. Oh, yeah. I know. Hey, we do have a machine over here yeah. that can do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think my student who was doing it, she was like drafting up like like you could do cricket, you know, like iron on or something, you know, a silk screen or something like that. <laughs> that's yeah, you guys have all the fancy fun tools over there. <laughs> We just have to learn how to use them all, right? <laughs> Some of them are just like, oh my goodness, it's a spaceship. <laughs> we'll yeah, we'll figure so it out. We'll figure out the ball. <laughs> yeah. I had written down some questions here and you've already pretty much answered it, but one was if you make a mistake, seam rip or embellish. I feel like I know the answer to that one. <laughs> you know, it really depends um i would i would probably seam rip and do it over again especially i mean the majority of of my sewing um has been client work you know for work i have you know since 2020 when everything shut down and that's when i really started focusing on the teaching because we didn't have any work live entertainment wasn't happening <laughs> so i was like oh okay we'll see how this goes with the teaching and really fell in love with it but that was when I finally had the opportunity to start making things for myself. So it really depends on, um, and I enjoy it so much. So now I'm like, gotta find time to do that. And now I can use the excuse of, well, I'm teaching people because I can't share Disney project stuff that we're learning. So I'm like, I have to make myself a dress, darn. Um, but so if it's for myself, um, it depends. You know, it depends how obvious it is. But for a client, I really would have to take it out and do it over again. But sometimes your oops is beyond repair um, or doing over again, and then you have to get creative. And a lot of, you know, one thing working in the entertainment industry and for shows is we do get to build things. And, and, and through that, I built my process, and that's kind of what I became known for. But in the beginning, when you first start working for shows and things, not a lot of stuff is built specifically for shows, especially if it's a community theater or a regional theater where they don't have a lot of budget. Um, so a, I would say 90% of your work is altering other clothes. Mm. So in altering, and it's not the most fun, and believe me, I'm, I'm not a fan of altering, but it gives you skills to learn how to make adjustments and fix things. And then it also helps you to learn how things are put together. A lot of how I've figured out how to make things are because I saw it when I was taking something else apart and redoing something else. So in those circumstances, sometimes you're limited with what you have available um, as far as fabric and, and the change that you need to make. So you have to get creative. So I think a lot of sewing in general is problem solving um, and what's going to work for that function and, and, you know, your style, if you're sewing for yourself or what's going to work, what can I sell to the client, um, <laughs> you know, that's still going to make it work. And it's, and it's going back to that perfectionism thing, you know, it's, it's about figuring out, like, like Tim Gunn says, make it work, right? Like it is really about that and not seeing an oops or, or a mistake as a, like that's the end and I have to say, oh, it's ruined, you know, like there's always a way, everything is figure outable. There's always a way to uh, make it different. And so, and the, we have a big thing and I know, um, I don't know if this is a theater thing, but it's definitely something we talk, you know, a mistake into design. Um, and, and I think that that happens a lot in sewing as well. You know, sometimes you have to add some extra fabric that you weren't planning on and it becomes a design feature and that kind of thing, or you embellish or embroider over um, something. And, um, you know, you kind of say, well, it was always meant to be that way. Isn't it great how I decided to do that? And you just kind of- It's a it. design element. Yeah. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's a little no bit mistake. of both, I would say, depending on the situation. Yeah, very cool. I mean, that I just have to say that reminded me of, I've had a photography business for 12 years and it reminded me how you said like 90% is, you know, um, tailoring and things like that. And it's like with photography, people think that you just click a camera or click the whatever and that's it. But I feel like 90% of the work goes into the editing for me. And then mm -hmm. you figure out, you know, there was like one time I had a, this is just random, but I photographed a proposal and it was at night. So everything was uh, out of focus. 
and I had to edit it to where it looked like it was in focus and I spent so much time, but it's like the same thing with, yeah. you know, sewing and creating costumes and stuff. Mm-hmm. It sounded like. Yeah, for but. sure. It's, it's, it, and, and I feel like with the alterations and things as I hated them, even when I was doing them, but they're necessary and it makes it when you get to like making your own clothes from scratch that when you get to a point that doesn't work you're not afraid to take it apart and do it again you know because because you're used to that Mm -hmm. and then and then learning how to do that and make it look like it wasn't done you know that's that's with alterations um but you learn a lot by doing that and i do value that time but i know that's not it's just I'm, I'm, I'm in a world where I have to do things that people don't usually like to do and then have to make it somehow <laughs> a good thing. Well, I know you had mentioned that you don't do as much sewing anymore, but when you do, what sewing machine do you sew on? This is, um, so I am a big fan of industrial sewing machines. Um, and the reason for that is just the amount of work that we're having to do on our machines all the time. And the crazy things I'm asked to sew with <laughs> are not always garment. You know, those monkey costumes I was talking about, we use buckram, which is a hat making material and wire um, as an in, inner structure. And my sewing machine guy came and he's like, do I want to know what you're sewing <laughs> on this machine? Because I'm like, probably not. Um, so I, I put my machines under a lot of strain and stress so i am definitely an industrial machine girl um and sergers i used to blow through them um the just the amount of work i would like burn out the motor and then i'd be on a crunch and need my serger um so i have several industrial machines my favorite one is a faf 138 that does a zigzag and um you know and straight stitch and the thing with industrial machines is they're more limited than domestic um we don't have a lot of the fancy stitches or features so especially mine are older like i don't have a lot of the, the newer um industrial machines and they just they're they're not computerized it's more mechanical so if i'm in a pinch sewing at two in the morning for a deadline the next day and something happens i can usually like figure it out um so and then i have i have a juki serger and a Wilcox and Gibbs, and I have a brother straight stitch. Those are my industrial, and I have a, a Pegasus cover stitch machine. But, um, and as far as domestic goes, I started with a white, uh, an old Viking white machine, and still have it somewhere. But our favorite kind of um, domestic machine in the costume world, because they are considered to be a little bit more durable, is the Bernina 1008. So an older Bernina model. So I do have one of those. And when I used to go out and do these show installs all the time, they would get me like, you know, just a, an inexpensive machine, a $200 singer machine and have me try to make like these crazy unitard costumes on that. And it was a struggle <laughs> um, just to, you know, just to get the stitch right, to go through, you know, and playing with needles and all the things. So I bought the 1008 to take with me. So at least I know I'm showing up with a hardy machine that can can go through the paces. Um, so that's my domestic machine that I use. Cool, very neat. Nice. Well, I could just say here, I could sit and talk to you forever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to wrap this, I don't want to wrap this up. <laughs> I think this means we have to have you back. Yes. We need okay. more stories. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Well, um, yeah, we do want to ask you a final question. So we were saying, um, let me back up. <laughs> no. We do want to ask you a final question. Uh, what is one piece of advice that you would give a new sewist or a new pattern maker in your circumstance um, that you can just pass along to them? Sure. Um, I mean, I would just say go for it, you know, is the number one thing. Try try different things. Be okay with making mistakes. And when you're learning something new, um, be, be graceful with yourself. Be kind to yourself. You're learning a new skill and it's going to take time. Um, so when you get into those 
those positions where you're frustrated and you just can't get something to work, it's really hard to get to a good place by just, it's got to work, it's got to work and keep going, grinding through. Sometimes the best thing is to take a break and step away. Um, I have this other saying where I say, you know, if you're working on a complicated project, maybe do a palate cleanser or something really simple, um, an easy quick sew or a quick pattern that's easy that you can do and you can build your confidence back. Um, mm -hmm. But just, you know, like Alex mentioned earlier, enjoy the journey and um, and know that that's that's part of it is to enjoy the journey. So if, if you're, if you're not enjoying it, step away and do something different. And sometimes that's the best thing, you know, you're fighting and you're trying to get it to work and then you step away and you come back to it a few hours later or the next morning, you're like, Oh, now I see it. But being in that frustrated mindset, it's hard to find the solution sometimes. So mm -hmm. um, that would be my, my best advice. I think that's wonderful yeah. advice. Yeah. With stepping away, that is so true. Like if you just need to step away for a little bit, come back, we do that when we're doing stuff for our social media, yeah. you know, you're designing something and you're just like looking at it for so long and you're nitpicking yeah. and then it's like, okay, back up, step away, come back. And then you're like, <laughs> okay, that looks better. <laughs> I have a, a funny story. Um, about that, that I always keep in mind. Um, my teacher, when I was, you know, in college in the beginning, learning about costuming and we're still actually good friends to this day, but she, uh, you know, when you're doing a show, as I, as I mentioned, it's, it's really stressful and it's like, you have to get, there's no, Oh, you know, I'm not going to do that. It's like, you have to mm -hmm. do it. Um, and she is a big lover of period costumes, you know, so, so I learned a lot with her about period costumes, but a lot of those are very labor intensive and like hand sewing, you know, cartridge pleating and, um, and things like that. So she, she says that, you know, she would be working on something like she, she's always working on something. If she was, she was in a meeting, she was hand sewing, you know, cause there's always stuff to get done. So she told me this she said this story one time and i've never forgotten it but she was working on these pumpkin breeches um which was a lot of cartridge pleating down into the leg hole a lot of hand sewing and she got so frustrated like it wasn't somehow working how she needed it to she was so frustrated with it she went and she just like i'm done with this and threw through the costume in the trash and was like i give up i'm giving up on it and you know it was late at night and she and she went to bed well, she has a wonderful husband who dug it out of the trash for her. But the next, oh. um, because he knew she would be like, oh my God, like I need to go back to that. Don't want to start over again. And um, she woke up the next morning and she's like, oh my God, like, what did I do? Ran and the trash guy had come and like taken the trash and she's like freaking out. Oh my God, like I, why did I do that? And luckily her husband had pulled it out for her and she, she could go back because when she goes back, she's like, it's not that bad. It's, it's not worth mm -hmm. starting all over. <laughs> like you can pick up and, and figure something else out. So I always yeah. think about that, you know, in the moment you're like, Rah! you know, you just can't do it. And then after you step away for a little bit, a lot of times you can just see things more clearly. You're just not coming from that ball of frustration. <laughs> that just melted my heart. I know. I was going to say, I think that's like the perfect <laughs> Yeah. wrap it up <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> it reminds me of when you're like smelling candles at the candle store and you like after you smell so many you can't smell them anymore so they give you like the coffee beans to smell it's like just smell some coffee and you can smell again <laughs> cleanse your palate, yeah. Yeah. Cleanse your nose. palate. Yeah. that's why i call it a palate cleanser project yeah that's do something because then you you build that confidence because it when something like that happens, when you get frustrated and you're not able to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, you start talking negatively to yourself and like, oh, I'm stupid. Why can't I get this? Or why is this so hard? This is such a simple thing that I should be able to do. And it's like, you're just not in the right frame of mind of finding mm -hmm. the solution um, mm -hmm. that will work. And, and you kind of, it's a spiral that you can start going down. So it's, 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 you need like a reset, you know, a lot of yep. times that helps a lot. And in my shop, when we would have, I would have stitchers that were working on something. It just was not work. Cause we're always doing these crazy things. And so I would, I would stop, you know, if somebody was fighting and fighting and fighting, I'm like, okay, how about we switch projects? Like you work on this hard thing that I'm working on and I'll work on that hard thing. And a lot of times that would be the thing that then we're all working on stuff again. Yeah. Teamwork makes the dream work. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, Trisha, do you want to go ahead and let everybody know where they can follow you? 
Absolutely. Thank you. I am everywhere at Creative Costume Academy. So my website is creativecostumeacademy.com. I hang out a lot on Instagram at creative.costume.academy. I'm on TikTok at creative, I think it's creative.costume.academy. I'm on YouTube and I, I'm very friendly and chatty in the DMs on Instagram. So um, please reach out and say hello and and um, if you're interested in pattern making, um, I do have Pattern Making Academy, which is always open. That's a, a, a partnership with Mimi G Style, and it, it teaches my theory, uh, the way my my teaching method. And then we go into like making some really awesome designs, and we just have a lot of fun. So if you want to have fun and learn pattern making, <laughs> come find come find me yeah. and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Trisha. We really appreciate it. And we're not joking. We want you back because yes. we have so much more to talk about. Awesome. I love it. I can't wait. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Trisha. Thank you.